we thought it was just a dry cough, just sinusitis. We didn't realize that it was in the RTV. I didn't have any other symptoms. There was a time I was waiting for the sensitivity results and Anna was at work. I was at work when the pulmonologist phoned me and the first thing he told me is, I'm, I'm sorry, things are looking bad. When he got home, he wanted to comfort me and I realized that um, I'm, I've got an infectious disease that's uh, really dangerous. She had locked me out, wasn't able to talk to her, there's a glass door, but uh, she was in tears. I was very upset, so I was crying a lot. And um, he wanted to come and give me a hug, but I knew it's, it's just going to be too dangerous, so I locked the door. This was the worst kind of helplessness, standing in front of a, a locked door. Your, your wife is in tears on the other side. And the, way, the reason she's locking you out is she's afraid, afraid for your safety. The first year, we were just trying to cope trying to get to lean through the treatment, trying to manage the side effects. You either get injections in your bum, and because I don't have a big bum. Every day I used to uh, put up a job for myself. The bad thing about this drug is that it um, causes hearing loss, that causes a high-pitched ringing in your ears. Every day when you start putting up the drip, the ringing in, the ear, in your ears starts, so you watch the drip, running in and then you realize, oh my gosh, am I busy losing my hearing? I ended up listening to music the whole day. I don't know why it's been crazy. Because I thought, you know, if you lose your hearing, you can't listen to music anymore. Every week I go for audiogram and it's just getting worse and worse. I'm sensitive to, to noise and she loved music, so before the TV, Whenever she'd play music and I had to work, there would be a bit of a conflict. And now the music was on 24-7, but now it was driving me crazy in a, in a different way because I realized that uh, this music might be the last music that she heard. They advised that you stay in isolation for two and a half months, but um, they, don't, they, they, they don't tell you actually when it's fine to, to kiss your husband. I mean, you asked them, and you don't sort of, I can remember, I thought, um, I don't want to ask the, the physician, am I allowed to kiss my husband? Because, uh, but it's something that goes through your mind and you really don't know the answer to. So we didn't kiss for six months. Uh, so it was, it was quite cool the first time that he, that he kissed me because I didn't expect it and he just decided he, he wanted to kiss me and um, yeah, that was quite special. You want to kiss her, but you feel guilty and a bit afraid at the same time. But I've been feeling guilty and afraid for so long and I decided to pack away the guilt and the fear and try and get on with, with living. We had our second first kiss. You realize uh, how special it is, how special a kiss is, how special it is to um, sleep next to each other at night. So we dug deeper and we, we were very fortunate to access new research drug called Zaquila. I got cured. Uh, I got my life back because I had excellent support and my message for people is that anyone can get TB and that's why we have to take care of the marginalized. We have to provide proper care for them and because if we don't in the end we will all suffer. If other people are suffering we all suffer. And in South Africa there's a, a very popular saying Ubuntu I am because of who we all are. And that feeds back into what tuberculosis is. It's a public health problem. And it's been a roller coaster ride since that first sputum result came back. And we, we're riding the wave. And we started out very low with not a lot of hope at times. And we've been very privileged that now the hope is burning bright. And we want to, want to share that hope and the, the message that there is life after TB and it can be overcome.